Hello, I'm Lauren Taylor, and we start with breaking news from Japan. Fire crews at Tokyo's Haneda International Airport are tackling a serious blaze on board a Japan Airlines Airbus A350 plane. Well, these are live pictures, and across the last hour or so, we've seen flames steadily engulf the craft. Reports suggest the plane collided with a Coast Guard plane on the runway. And this was the moment the plane landed at Haneda International. Most of the 379 people on board the plane, passengers and crew, have been safely evacuated, according to uh, Japan Airlines. Although several are missing, that's from the Coast Guard plane that was involved in the collision. A spokesman said the aircraft had arrived in Tokyo from the northern island of Hokkaido. Japan's Coast Guard says its aircraft was on its way to Niigata Airport to deliver aid to the earthquake-hit Noto Peninsula. That's according to Reuters. Well, let's uh, return to uh, the scene at the moment at the airport where the firefighters have been trying to tackle that blaze now for around about two hours. And Professor Graham Braithwaite from Cranfield University uh, has rejoined us. Uh, just for people who are just starting to watch this now, tell us about that, that moment when the, pl the plane came in and, and what, you, what your thoughts are given the scale of the fire that's uh, resulted from that collision. So there's a limited amount of information available other than that CCTV footage, which seems to suggest um, that the aircraft has collided with that Coast Guard aircraft, which has, has presumably encroached onto the uh, runway clearance area. So the A350 that's landing, which is that JAL aircraft, which is quite a large uh, aircraft, seems to have, have hit something. If you look at the damage on the, the left-hand engine, it, it, it looks like it's clearly impacted something. And that, that presumably has then ruptured a uh, few lines. I don't, I don't know on which aircraft you can see a very uh, large fireball at, at that point. And then from that point on, the, the, there appears to be fuel leaking, which is, is, is causing that, that fire as the aircraft uh, rolls out to a stop. You know, clearly for the uh, flight deck crew, they were likely to have seen what was happening. There's very little, in fact, there's nothing really that they can do at that very late stage. It looks like it was too late to go around. Um, so, so, so whatever they've hit uh, has been at that very last moment. And then their focus will have been on making sure that the aircraft stops as quickly as it can. And at that stage, the fire service would have uh, tried to respond to be there within two minutes to be, to be starting to um, lay foam onto the, the ground, knock back the flames enough so that people can evacuate from that aircraft. Uh, and it seems as though that procedure was quite uh, efficient and the, the 379 people on, on board w did all get out safely. Um, and it sounds and looks as though they were very lucky because what happened afterwards has been has been quite extraordinary. The level of, um, of flames and, and kind of destruction to that plane has been really quite rapid and, and quite extreme. I, I think to hear that everybody got off that gel aircraft is 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 an incredible positive and that and it shows you just how much has gone into that in terms of aircraft design, in terms of the design of the, the cabin for people to be able to safely evacuate. And in particularly in terms of of the crew training, so so the cabin crew in particular would have made a huge difference. We know from previous accidents that when something happens, even for those who were prepared as passengers, and in this case they were not prepared. This was was clearly a surprise event. It's really how the cabin crew open the exits, alert people which direction is safe to go. Uh, they will shout at people to make sure that they move swiftly. They don't try and bring anything with them and so on. Uh, and of course, it's the cabin crew who are the last off the aircraft. So I think years of training, um, just, just the whole approach that Japan Airlines take and, and, and all the airlines around the world will have made a, a huge difference to this successful outcome. In terms of the investigation now, um... We know that the plane that uh, the, the Coast Guard plane that was involved in this incident was on its way to deliver aid to in, a, in an earthquake disaster zone. How much do human factors normally play a part in, in, in accidents like this? I mean, is that something you've looked into? And tell us how often it's to do with human factors and how often it's to do with the uh, aircraft design and, and the rest of it. Yeah, it's a really important question as to, to where the focus of the investigation will be. And they will start off very open-minded uh, and will try and make sure that they gather together as much of, of the evidence that might be perishable. So, so in other words, the eyewitness testimonies and so on will become very important. Recorded data will become very important. And, and of course, we'll want to understand human actions. 
but, but positive and negative. So there's a lot of focus on the fact that in, in many accidents, we see human factors mentioned as, in some cases, the leading cause. But actually, usually there are many factors around that. And, and the bit that sometimes we forget is that the human performance is often a, a very positive thing as well. So we may find, for example, on the crew of the landing aircraft, that their decision um, to, to, to continue with the landing and land the way they did might have actually saved more lives than if they, for example, had tried to go around. And, and we, we don't know the, the, the circumstances of that yet. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a fascinating area that you bring up there, because actually that, that decision would have been... I mean, presumably, if you if you have something on fire, you, you do want to, to come into land. But, uh, but as you say, you, you don't necessarily know whether there's something else on the ground that would that would cause more of a problem. So that, that would have been a sort of split second decision from the from the pilot. And, and I think at this stage, we're, we're still not not completely clear as to where the event happened. Was it was it as it was landing? Did it did it hit something on that on that landing uh, roll? It obviously it happened in the dark. So, so as for what the crew could see, whether that aircraft was moving, whether it was moving rapidly, the, the Coast Guard aircraft, all of these things were factored in and the, the, the flight deck crew would have had to make a, a, a split second decision, same for the cabin crew uh, and so on. So when we look at human factors investigation, we don't just look for the errors that people made, we also look for their positive actions. And in some cases that is actually more useful in terms of informing future training uh, and so on. So, so we'll definitely take that not for blame approach and definitely try and learn positives as well as uh, mm. identify the negatives. And, and it's interesting that you, you say, as you say, that, that in this case, it does seem as though 379 people are, are off safety, and that's a, a major achievement. Unfortunately, the crew of the Coast Guard plane, five of them are still missing after that collision, and uh, one is known to have uh, survived and, and got out. We don't know about the others. Um, tell us a bit about the, 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 the scale of the fire afterwards, though, because uh, although, although passengers have got off quite quickly, presumably it will be a bit alarming for airlines and for airports and anybody who deals with, with passenger safety to see quick just how fast the, the fire spread afterwards. Um, and that's a very new plane, the A350. Will that be in part to do with the materials they use these days for building planes? Look, it would definitely be part of the investigation to establish whether that is indeed a feature, you know, whether the construction and a largely composite fuselage has contributed to that. But actually for this type of event, um, a, a severe collision like this, we would be unsurprised to actually see um, the, the, the size of that fire. Actually, the important thing is whether we protect the occupants of the aircraft during that initial phase of the fire. So although it looks very shocking and it, and it looks particularly shocking because it, it happened at night, obviously it's a very uh, bright fireball. Actually, we may find the aircraft did its job very well in protecting the occupants until it was safe uh, and the, the fire service had arrived to, to, to help them evacuate. So I appreciate for a passenger, none of this felt safe, but actually if the outcome is that everybody uh, was able to get off that A350 successfully, then actually that's a really uh, positive outcome, uh, whilst acknowledging that the very tragic outcome for, for potentially for those on board the other aircraft. And, and you, you were talking earlier about the safety culture at uh, Japan Airlines. Tell us a bit more about that. So it was fascinating that they, that they learned from one of the incidents back in the early 80s uh, or the mid 80s. Tell a bit more about how that that, that incident and, and what they learned from it. So, so Japan Airlines unfortunately suffered an accident in 1985 where due to a, a faulty repair, the, um, the rear bulkhead protecting the, the, the aircraft blew out and actually took the tail off the aircraft. Uh, and, and the crew uh, somehow managed to fly on for about half an hour um, until unfortunately it hit a, a mountainside and 505 people lost their lives in that accident and it's the world's worst single aircraft accident and none of it was JAL's fault and yet the reaction in Japan Airlines was, was a deep sense of loss of, of their own colleagues, of their passengers, you know, had a profound effect on them but, but also on aviation safety globally. Um, but within Japan Airlines, uh, about 20 years later, employees were saying we're, we're, we're perhaps in, uh, forgetting what it's like to get it wrong. You know, we have new employees coming in who perhaps assume that aviation is safe and it's not, uh, all, it's not because of all that huge effort that actually goes into keeping it safe. We want to remind people of what goes into it. 
So they created a, a center in their corporate headquarters, a safety promotion center. It included artifacts from that accident, from, from some of the letters that passengers wrote before the aircraft uh, eventually crashed. And every employee, whatever level in the company, has to go through that as part of their induction. And they learn about how in incredibly important safety is and how much hard work goes in to deliver that. So that's a really important part of their culture as an airline and, and I know having worked with with various people there over the years that there is a, a profound personal commitment towards safety and and you know I, I know any any kind of accident um, we find tragic as an aviation family but but particularly for Japan Airlines this this will be a difficult day. Professor Graham Braithwaite thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us and your expertise on the subject thank you.